it's a, a great pleasure for me to uh, welcome uh, you all to this uh, very important uh, event that we have uh, today uh, organized uh, with the help of the uh, ambassador of uh, armenia to india uh, his excellency amin uh, martirosyan and uh, his colleague uh, professor uh, suren uh, manukyan uh, who is a, a lecturer at the professor at the yerevan state university and also associated with the american uh, uh, university of armenia and today we also have uh, uh, with us uh, uh, two distinguished uh, panelists uh dr suman keshari uh dr suman keshari is here yes yes she's there okay uh she has a long experience of uh, working in the government and now she is a, a full time uh, writer she is a poet a social activist and uh, she has been uh, uh, she is also a co editor of a book uh that is she is uh, co-editing with uh, uh mr mane makrachian uh, on armenian genocide and this book is in uh, hindi uh we would have released this book uh, had we been able to organize a physical event but maybe she will talk about this and i also have uh, professor uh, ashwani mahapatra Uh, who is a professor at the Center for West Asian uh, Studies at the GNU and an expert he, on the region? Yeah. Is there? No, not yet. He will join us in a while. So he'll be joining. And uh, we have with us uh, from uh, what I see, thirty-four uh, people who are logged in at this point of time, and uh, they are uh, uh, distinguished uh, uh, academics, diplomats. Uh, scholars and uh, many of them are uh, with us uh, at the uh, Vivekananda International uh, Foundation. So today we are uh, uh, discussing. Uh, today actually is the fifth, twenty uh, fourth uh, April, and uh, this is uh, uh, every year. Uh, uh, this is the day when uh, the unfortunate uh, uh, event of the genocide of the Armenians. Uh, which happened in uh, 1915 and went on for several years. Uh, that event is uh, celebrated uh, and commemorated uh, over uh, all over the world. And uh, uh, Ambassador Martirosyan and I had discussed this uh, some time ago, and uh, we thought that uh, we hold a, a, a uh, event, uh, online event, and uh, to have some idea. <coughs> Uh, in india about this uh, very tragic event uh, that uh, took place uh, in the early parts of the last uh, century and uh, this has been uh, discussed a lot researched a lot and it's also uh, a uh, in some sense a controversial uh, event because uh, the turks uh, do not accept that uh, uh, such a genocide happened but that's the politics uh, of it Uh, so we will uh, discuss uh, some of this uh, today, but uh, I just want to uh, note one or two points about uh, this. Uh, one is that uh, this event was considered to be the, the first genocide of the last century, but uh, history tells us that uh, there have been many, many uh, such events, unfortunate, tragic events uh, throughout, and continue to happen uh, even today. uh so uh, one should uh, think as to why uh, uh genocides happen and why they have become uh, almost an important part of uh, the uh, contemporary politics that's something uh, to uh, think about uh the second is that uh, uh this event uh, why is it uh, that uh, we are not able to have a one view over it why is it turkey uh, which continues to deny that uh, such an event happened and uh, that is the uh, politics of it of course uh, as we know that uh, at that point of time uh, the armenians were living in uh, 
the uh, Ottoman Empire, and uh, there was there's a long history of uh, the Armenians, uh, the how the Armenians uh, and uh, ethnic Armenians were treated uh, in the uh, Ottoman Empire. Uh, uh, the oppression and uh, the discrimination and uh, their existence as uh, second-class citizens. These were the factors. But also the geopolitics of the time was also a very important uh, factor. Uh, there was, of course, uh, these, are the, these were the last two days of uh, the Ottoman Empire and the disintegration of a, an empire which had uh, existed for several hundred years. Uh, was bound to have uh, repercussions and uh, the genocide uh, happened during the First World War, the early years of uh, the First World War. Of course, before that, there have been uh, many massacres, uh, etc., of which uh, the Armenians were the victims. And uh, there was a, a big uh, a politics, uh, geopolitics of the region uh, that was also responsible for some of these uh, events. But uh, I will not take uh, more time. And uh, now I uh, invite uh, Ambassador uh, Amin uh, Martiro Seyan, uh, who has been uh, uh, Ambassador of Armenia to India since 2015, a former uh, advisor to the Armenian Foreign Minister, former ambassador to Germany, uh, former uh, uh, PR to the United Nations, a deputy foreign minister, an MP, and has many uh, things to uh, his credit. So, uh, Ambassador uh, Martir Sian, maybe you could begin, make your comments in about uh, 10 minutes or so, and then we will have the rest of the program. We hope to finish it by uh, 1 o'clock, and we want to keep some time for uh, Q&A as well. So, may I invite uh, you, Amin, uh, to make your uh, remarks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gupta. Good morning uh, to everybody. I hope that you all uh, are doing well nowadays and uh, let's, let me express my profound appreciation to you all for being uh, today with us. And my special thanks to Mr. Arvind Gupta and his team for organizing this video conference uh, by uh, the IF under this very unique circumstances and uh, let me assure you that it will take a very special place in the chronology of events dedicated to the uh, commemoration of the Armenian genocide. So, uh, you know, regardless of the social status or political preferences, Without any exaggerations, let me tell you that Armenians all over the world unite on this very uh, special day every year to pay a tribute uh, and honor the memory of one and a half million Armenians uh, who fell victim to the first genocide of the 20th century. It was meticulously planned and executed by the government of Ottoman Empire. And our gathering today amidst an unprecedented global pandemic is a testament to our nation's commitment to human rights and justice. Uh, it reflects positively on our desire to learn from the past and also evolve accordingly. Uh, modern technical means of communication not only have made this discussion possible, but also enable us to democratize experience sharing. And uh, I do hope that discussions that will follow will contribute to similar gains in our global consciousness. Uh, usually our reasons for this gathering are threefold. Uh, first, we gather to pay tribute to the memory of those who perished. Second, we gather to remind the world that never again ought not to be a rhetorical appeal by international organizations and celebrities voiced at noble summits, but otherwise forgotten. And third, we gather to explore new waves of raising awareness about Armenian genocide 
and obviously promoting its recognition internationally. So uh, many leading countries are around the world have acknowledged this crime against humanity. Uh, latest example on December 12, 2019, the United States Senate has voted unanimously to recognize the genocide of Armenians by Ottoman Empire in defiance of the Turkish President Erdogan, whose various political initiatives and steps uh, had come into conflict with the interest of the United States. Thus, the US Congress, US Congress vote has brought to 34 the number of countries uh, who qualified the mass killings of Armenians in Ottoman Empire as an act of genocide. And uh, we are very grateful to all those uh, nations. Uh, obviously, that in this very day, our thoughts revert time and again to the tragic events of 1915. And we keep asking, why did it happen to us? Why did the great powers of the time turn a blind, blind eye when atrocities were being carried out in a broad daylight? And of course, as Mr. Gupta has mentioned, the most important contemporary issue, did the world learn from the tragedy of Armenians? So presumably one may contend that the world has changed today. In 1948, the international community adopted the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. I quote, to prevent from happening again that what happened to Armenians during World War, World War I and to Jews during World War II. End of quote, Raphael Lemkin, who coined the term genocide. Never again uh, was the basic message of the authors of the Genocide Convention. Yet, Holocaust and the tragic events of World War II did not conclude the age of genocides. Since then, ethnic cleansing became part of the political culture, uh, an acceptable way for solving inter-ethnic problems. The world has witnessed later Rwanda, Cambodia, and Darfur. And who knows what would have happened had not India come to rescue the then Eastern Pakistan from the atrocities of their Western compatriots in 1971. Uh, as Mr. Gupta, you flag this question where Armenians are very often asked about the root causes of the genocide. In this regard, uh, an international expert community dedicating volumes to, the, to this topic came up with three major interpretations. Often cited and so-called geopolitical explanation or interpretation refers to the Armenian-Russian alliance in World War I. Uh, although, if we look at the Turkish behavior before, behavior toward Armenians, both before and after World War I, this interpretation doesn't hold. And we found that starting from pre-war years under Sultan Abdul Hamid the Bloody, through the war dominance, wartime dominance of the Committee of Union and Progress, and the immediate post-war rise of the Turkish nationalists led by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, Turkey resolved to be rid of all Armenians, and not only Armenians, but also other Christian communities through steady oppression, mass murder, attrition, expulsion, forced conversion and assimilation. So by 1924, Turkey had cleansed Asia Minor of its 1.5 million Armenians. Uh, the second economic explanation alludes to the disproportional wealth and 
economic pull of the Armenian minority in the empire. And the third interpretation deals with the political transformation attempted by the Young Turks with the goal of uh, uh, consolidating the state and promoting uh, a sort of, you know, multi uh, multi party democracy in in Turkey. I would like to elaborate a little bit more on this latest uh, interpretation regarding, you know, uh, consolidation of the power of the state and uh, promotion of multi-party multi -party democracy in Turkey. And uh, in this regard, Mr. Gupta, I would like to recall the 19th century British thinker, John Stuart Mill, who argued in one of his, you know, in one of his works that uh, democracy was almost impossible in multi-ethnic uh, societies. So according to Mill, democratic decision making can take place only if the ethnic differences needing resolution are not immense. And although democracy does not require a completely homogeneous society, nevertheless, it does require a certain level of unity and trust between its various ethnic groups. So in the absence of such conditions, the very process of decision making regarding conflicting issues can threaten the peaceful coexistence of ethnic groups and take uh, most violent forms. Uh, the most extreme, extreme interpretation of, uh, you know, this Mill's uh, theory or proposition according to uh, the prominent American social scientist Samuel Lipset, leads to the conclusion that the only way for uh, multi-ethnic societies with the big ethnic differences to build democracy is to eliminate its ethnic diversity via four uh, sort of possible mechanisms, expulsion, assimilation, partition, and genocide. And so a century ago, the history of ethnic tensions in our part of the world proved above mentioned assumption and its interpretation. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, the Armenian minority in the Ottoman Empire at first fell victim of ethnic cleansing. And later uh, in the beginning of 20th century of genocide, and deprivation of its historical homeland. And simultaneously, the majority of Armenian, surviving Armenians and other ethnic minorities of the Ottoman Empire underwent forcible assimilation or expulsion from Turkey. So therefore the annihilation of the Armenian as well as other Christian minorities and particularly I would like to mention Greeks and Assyrians, was not the product of a single cause. At play were fears of foreign interference, as you mentioned, Mr. Gupta, Turkish nationalism, ethnic rivalries, economic envy, and a desire to, uh, to maintain and strengthen political and social uh, dominance. So a combination of those motivations was manifest in each period and location. Uh, now I'd like to draw your attention to another important issue, since we are talking about, you mentioned you raised this issue of genocide denial by Turkey, a very important uh, issue that for decades, Turkish society has been brainwashed about its own history. And to a large extent, society is not familiar with its factual past. There is a kind of memory disconnect and selectivity, uh, which is not accidental. Uh, because after establishing the Turkish Republic, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, its founding father, deliberately cut the cultural ties between Ottoman Empire and its successor state, Turkish Republic of Turkey. 
To this end, in 1928, the Latin-based modern alphabet replaced the Arabic one used by the Turks in the preceding centuries. And it was done by design and pursued uh, the various goals. And particularly, I think the most importantly, its goal was to, re to remove the symbolic connections the new country had with its predecessor, the Ottoman Empire. And this thought out policy also had a dramatic, e dramatic effect of making the past inaccessible to the next generations. Of course, uh, you know, with the exception of some, you know, privileged uh, few that had specialized training in the old script. Nevertheless, it is becoming apparent that it is, it is difficult to indefinitely blindfolding an entire nation. Many Turkish writers, journalists, and representatives of civil society now challenge their own government policies by particularly questioning its orthodox position regarding the Armenian genocide. And regrettably, in parallel to those developments, official censorship continues to serve as a dexterous tool of the Turkish government in manipulating its domestic opinion. So, and this is the very essence of the notorious Article 301 of the Turkish Criminal Code, under which many intellectuals have been prosecuted and even expelled from the country, including a Nobel Prize winning novelist, uh, Orhan Pamuk. So, but, and let me, uh, using this uh, occasion, I would like to inform uh, distinguished participants of this discussion that the genocide is not the only pending issue in our uh, relations with Turkey. Since 1991, when Armenia regained its independence, Republic of Turkey, under different pretexts, has refused to establish diplomatic relations with Armenia. And in the absence of war, it is unprecedented case in contemporary international relations. And moreover, besides the, uh, the uh, absence of uh, diplomatic relations, Turkey unilaterally still continues to maintain the land blockade on Armenia. Despite all this, in 2008, again, I would like to remind uh, participants that in 2008, Armenia made an offer to Turkey to start the process of normalization of our bilateral relations. That initiative was uh, broadly supported and recognized internationally. And the principal point of departure for the thorny negotiations was that the process of reconciliation uh, to be designed and implemented without any preconditions. So this was the fundamental rule of the game. Uh, however, immediately after signing of protocols, the then Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan, by grossly violating the above mentioned fundamental rule of the arrangements, had torpedoed the whole process, political process. And since then, no rapprochement was effected and reconciliation became daily more and more uh, difficult. And on this occasion, I would like to reiterate our position that Armenia is ready without any preconditions to establish diplomatic relations with Turkey. However, genocide issue is non-negotiable. We believe that reconciliation requires compassion and its chances are diminished by continuous denial, which traumatizes both sides. And understanding and acknowledgement the deeds of the past government and the responsibility of the current generation, although not culpable, to recognize and to condemn the crime is an indispensable component of reconciliation. 
And as we all know, some nations undertook this painful experience of recognition in order to be relieved of the traumatizing consequences of their own history. No doubt, functional neighborly relations between Armenia and Turkey will strengthen peace and stability in the whole region and to the benefit of all its nations. To, uh, to build a better uh, future, we should draw lessons from the common past. However, we cannot revise uh, our history. So, uh, Mr. Gupta, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think I went over the time that I thought would speak. Uh, here, I would like to conclude and will gladly answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Uh, your microphone has to be switched on. All right. Okay. 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 Thank you. Dr. Gupta. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, your remarks. I think uh, they have clarified uh, the background uh, to this uh, tragic event. And also, uh, you have given us an uh, insight into the dynamics of uh, Armenia-Turkey relations. Now, uh, we uh, go to Professor Suren Manukian, uh, who is uh, speaking to us from uh, Yerevan. As I said, he is an expert on uh, uh, the genocide issues and he's also uh, associated, apart from his uh, academic uh, uh, pursuits, he's also, uh, he also works at the Armenian Genocide Museum and uh, Institute. He is a PhD in history and uh, an academic of uh, repute. So, uh, Professor Manukyan. Professor Manukyan? You have to switch yes. on your. Do you hear me? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me. Uh, Thank you for this chance for this chance to share my uh, ideas, my my uh, opinions, and uh, uh, um, the results of, of my research uh, uh, related to the topic of Armenian genocide. And uh, uh, Ambassador briefly uh, outlined some causes of Armenian genocide, and because the topic of our uh, today's uh, conference and history and and uh, uh, perspectives. I want uh, uh, just a bit uh, touch on uh, history of Armenian genocide because I think this historical context is very important to understand uh, the uh, the dynamic of genocide and, and understand uh, now the uh, developments to understand why Turkey denies Armenian genocide to understand why. It it is the topic of our, some discussions uh, among the politicians, first of all. I want to stress on political um, aspect of this topic because among historians, we have uh, uh, almost uh, total, total uh, um, consensus around the question, uh, around the question whether it was genocide or not. Uh, because International Association of Genocide Scholars, which is the leading organization uh, involving in the research on not only Armenian genocide, but all, all, all genocides happened in, um, the, uh, in the history of mankind, uh, two times unanimously adopted a, a resolution, a declaration, um, pointing that uh, Armenian genocide is uh, 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 all 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 uh, points of United Nations uh, Convention for uh, genocide prevention and punishment uh, they are corresponding to the uh, historical facts historical developments of Armenian genocide uh, uh, first of all uh, I want to start with the uh, uh, nature of, of of the Ottoman Empire Ottoman Empire at the beginning of 20th century, um, about two and a half million of uh, million Armenians lived in the Ottoman Empire, and the, the eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire laid in Armenian highland, uh, uh, highland. That was the cradle of Armenian civilization, 
where the Armenian people emerged, established their statehood, statehoods, and developed a unique culture. And uh, uh, Armenians were one of the uh, major minorities, if I can say uh, in this way, um, one of the main, main my, uh, major minorities of Ottoman Empire. Um, this huge uh, empire stretching from the Middle East to South Europe and Northern Africa. Um, and uh, throughout its existence, uh, the Ottoman Empire fed on violence. And it's very fundamental uh, thing we need to stress on because sometimes some people say, why one day Turks decided to, uh, to, to er exterminate Armenian population of empire. It was not one time act, it was a process. It was uh, a process of um, the uh, punitive measures uh, often took the form of planned and coordinated campaign of extermination and terror, which targeted entire communities, not all the Armenians. Uh, not only Armenian uh, population of empire, uh, but uh, also other other uh, national groups of Ottoman Empire, uh, and this violence was instrumental to in maintaining the unity of empire and resolving domestic issues. Unfortunately, all the history of Ottoman Empire is the attempt to resolve to solve the problems, internal problems, domestic problems. Uh, with the means, with the with the uh, tools of violence, and uh, I think this is the uh, the first uh, important thing we should stress. Uh, of course, Armenians uh, um, Armenians living in Ottoman Empire at the beginning of 20th century uh, were uh, were quite a strong uh, strong uh, minority, uh, and uh, they they lived in. Uh, a big patriarchal clans, uh, the uh, city dwellers were mostly traders and craftsmen, and as a rule they lived in compact quarters, mainly uptown. Uh, it was educated uh, community and um, educational endeavors gained momentum uh, in the mid-19th centuries uh, when hundreds, hundreds, hundreds and thousands of uh, primary schools, colleges, uh, uh, um, were established in almost every city and village in the Ottoman Empire. Why I think it's important to stress on because in this uh, and not only schools, also publishing houses uh, throughout the empire and in capital of empire. Uh, and uh, why it's important because to understand that Armenians, first of all, were not separated minority; they were integral part of Ottoman Empire. And this genocide was implemented uh, against its uh, by empire against its own own citizens. It was uh, Armenians were not uh, uh, I don't know invaders. Armenians were not uh, enemies in war. They were own citizens of Ottoman Empire, and that's why we can also uh, look at the Armenian genocide not just as uh, uh, geopolitical, geopolitical phenomenon, geopolitical event, but at the same time as a um, uh, tremendous uh, gross violation of human rights. Because millions of the citizens of the state were firstly deprived, were uh, looted, uh, and then exterminated by its own state, by its own government. Um, and, you know, as loyal citizens of Ottoman Empire, Armenians invested their skills and capability in the development of the empire and made an overwhelming contribution to its economy, prosperity uh, and, and, and culture. Uh, for example, the Armenians, as, as uh, Ambassador mentioned, played a particularly heftily role in the development of, of Ottoman economy. Uh, first, the banks were, or were uh, created in Ottoman Empire were created by Armenians. Um, the, the Armenians had uh, their uh, Armenian share in, in Ottoman in Ottoman trade amounted to thirty percent uh, in in uh, in uh, uh, of the whole trade of, of Ottoman Empire, and uh, this very well integrated society, very well integrated community was targeted, and uh, uh, why? Uh, 
of course, we can speak now uh, about here about uh, envy, maybe envy, because uh, after the attempt to create national state, uh, after the uh, transformation of the Ottoman Empire into national state, uh, uh, what happened after the uh, what started after the uh, revolution, so-called Young Turkish Revolution, then new political forces came to power in Turkey and they proclaimed um, uh, the ideals of, of French Revolution, ideals of equality, fraternity, and um, in this society, Armenians welcomed the, uh, the uh, the declarations of 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 uh, young Turkish party and uh, Armenians uh, welcomed the change with enthusiasm. Uh, several demonstrations and meetings were organized in support of the new regime. But Armenians were identified not as uh, partners in the in the way of transformation of society, in the way of transformation of uh, the empire into state, into national state. Where they were considered, they were identified as um, com or as competitors. They were um, uh, identified as um, rivals, uh, very dangerous. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, young Turkish party tried to exclude the possible rivalry in the way of creation of this national state. Another point I want to stress on is. Of course, geopolitical, uh, geopolitical shifts, geopolitical changes, those took place uh, uh, took place before First World War. <coughs> Ottoman Empire was in decline, and this situation of frustration, of this decline of the glorious, glorious Ottoman Empire, uh, was affected the attitude and uh, poli po uh, policy of. Uh, of young Turkish party greatly, because um, uh, uh, in the situation then Turkey, uh, Turkey, uh, Turkey's defeats in in various wars, uh, uh, and uh, the situation then many promises of Ottoman Empire, Romania, Serbia, Montenegro, Bulgaria, Greece, Albania, uh, proclaimed their independence. In this situation, uh, um, the ruling elites of Ottoman Empire identified Armenians' demands for equality, for, for equal rights, as an existential threat. And, uh, you know, it's very interesting that I, I usually say that Armenian genocide began from the very short but very dangerous world. It was worldwide. After the Young Turkish Revolution, Armenians began to ask question why why shouldn't we have the same rights why shouldn't we uh, be equal in political uh, in political status in, in economic um, uh, status why shouldn't we be uh, the same uh, the uh, equal uh, citizens of turkish state and th this very short word why was very dangerous in the minds of the rulers of empire because they attended uh, to identify Armenians as, uh, as you mentioned, second class citizen for ages. And it was for them, it was not uh, easy to, to, uh, to admit that it, that it was unacceptable for them to admit Armenians uh, yesterday slaves as, uh, as an equal partner in, in in the future development of empire. Um, of course, uh, here another point, my third point I want to stress on is the planned and intended uh, uh, nature of Armenian genocide. Uh, sometimes the uh, debates around Armenian genocide uh, are uh, developing around this case of intent. You know, in genocide convention adopted in 1948, we have this uh, concept that genocide is the act of uh, destruction, intentional destruction of community. And this word intent is very, uh, very difficult to, 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 uh, uh, to find. Very, it's, it's, uh, 
very uh, uh, it's not tangible thing to to uh, and it's not easy to find intent in each genocide because it's very natural every criminal uh, tries to conceal its uh, its uh, criminal actions that's why no one genocider no one uh, organizer decision makers of genocide no one left just written statement uh, about about uh, future killings even Holocaust, that one of the most uh, recognized and well-documented genocide in the human history, even in Holocaust, you cannot find any one document uh, signing or writing by, by the leader of Germany uh, with a very clear uh, appeal, very clear order to kill Jews. And it's, it's, uh, that's why uh, this, but we have another indirect, uh, we can find indirect evidences, indirect uh, uh things that uh, can be analyzed and uh, first of all it is structure of killing Armenian genocide were, was not action was not um uh just massacre organized in local place by local people it was uh, there was a structure of killing and uh, in the structure of killing uh we have this uh, situation of the uh, hierarchy of killing and orders coming from the top uh, to uh, the bottom of society, and um, here uh, we can we can see also a societal consensus in the case of killing of Armenians. Because unfortunately, but all all many many uh, stratas, many groups of Ottoman Empire, they were involved in this process of killing. Of course, it started from the. Uh, upper circle of criminals responsible for the Armenian genocide that uh, involves uh, ultimate decision makers, the leaders of the Ottoman party. Of course, they work out the ideology underlying the genocide and oversaw the implementation of uh, uh, the massacres and related issues. Um, and um, among them, three uh, pre, um, pre, uh, main um, uh, uh, organizers about emperor and uh, general uh, but of course we have the middle level or organizations local bureaucrats and to accomplish armenian deportation at massacres in provinces uh, the party is sent or reverted to the institute of executive secretaries with great power carried out uh, orders coming from the center and these local part, party organiz, uh, party st structures, they organizing meetings, recruiting gangs uh, of killers, inciting population against Armenians and issuing orders for the deportations. The police and gendarmerie were also directly and actively involved. Uh, all the communication infrastructure of empire was uh, under supervision of Minister of Infer and was and had critical role in implementation of Armenian genocide and also army was involved so here we have many many um, indirect uh, evidences proofs that it was structure it was structure it was state organized event and that's why even if we don't have this signed paper we can say that all these structures could not uh, uh, or could not uh, operate without this centralized idea, centralized uh, uh, idea of uh, of uh, possible uh, implementation of this plan, and the last thing I want to stress on is uh, uh, impunity. Uh, I think it's very important there and very instrumental, not only for Armenian genocide case, but also for uh, the, the for other genocides, and I think it's very important to. Uh, stress on because unfortunately uh, we have the reality that uh, uh, to kill one person is uh, more punishable than to organize genocide in in many genocides we have we can that we can observe the situation then the main organ even the main organ not all the main organizers were brought to court uh, to court and in Armenian case, also we had this not only tradition of minority killings, but uh, tradition of uh, impunity and this 
in this in, in this atmosphere of total uh, impunity creates the psychological sense of normality of these killings a normality of armenian killings and uh, armenians were victims in some measure um, uh, they adopted to their role taking situation to a perpetual danger and pressure as normal and inevitable fate and institutional reality of the empire and you know this system was beyond contest or even discussion of change from the psychological point of view the most dangerous thing was the fact that impunity and total permissiveness of crime even license to license to kill members of the other other ethnic groups was taken as a normal situation very natural phenomenon the way it should be and nothing else uh, and such beliefs uh, unfortunately we can see in many genocides and ongoing genocides ongoing uh, events in darfur in in, in other states in another uh, in other uh, ongoing uh, um, hot hot spots uh, uh, of, of of the world uh, and uh, finishing this uh, case of impunity i want just to remind that uh it's paradoxically but but it, it may be strange uh for from the nowadays lenses but turkey maybe was the first state that recognized armenian genocide why because after the defeat uh of the ottoman empire in first world war some of the young Tur criminals attempted to avoid uh, some of the young Tur criminals were brought to court to court and uh, uh, the trials trials were organized um, and um, uh, or, or Ottoman Ottoman state decided uh, new form Turkish government after First World War um, to preclude pos of course possible interference from the great uh, empires decided to bring to trial the organizers of the Armenian genocide and those responsible for dragging Turkey into the war investigation committees were set up to collect incriminating evidence with the respect to armenian massacres secret telegrams official documents orders eyewitness accounts uh, and special military courts were formed in january 1919 uh, and um, you know it's very important that it was proven and we have this verdict verdict uh, uh, by the turkish court with the turkish judges with the turkish Executors that it was proved that Armenian deportation that massacres did not constitute military or disciplinary measures neither were they limited or local uh, uh, limited uh, limited or local uh, scope as the criminals tried to present and they were premeditated and thoroughly planned activities in, uh, initiated and carried out by the order of the young Turk government so uh, and some leaders of this party Tala, Denver, Jamal or Nazem uh, I mentioned before uh, uh, were sentenced to death they, in, in absentia was of course they sentenced were sentenced to death and other members of government received various terms of imprisonment so now we can say that Turkey was the first state that uh, recognized admitted uh, that um, the massacres of Armenians what happened uh, to, to Armenia with Armenians in the uh, Ottoman Empire was premeditated exterminate attempts of exterminate uh, the nation so these points I wanted just to enrich the uh, presentation of uh, ambassador uh, and of course I'm open to questions thank you for for your uh, for your uh, attention thank you thank you very much uh Professor Monukian for making those uh, additional points. I think uh, the two uh, presentations have uh, added to our understanding of uh, this uh, event. Now, uh, we are running out of time and uh, I would like now to uh, turn to Dr. Suman Keshari, uh, who is uh, uh, co-editing, as I said, a book on Armenian genocide in Hindi. So, uh, Dr. Suman Kishari, would you like to make your remarks and try to keep them as brief as you can? Microphone, microphone, if you could switch it on. 
Hello. It comes. Uh, thank you so much, Gustadi. Uh, his, his Excellency and other people. Hi. मैं अपनी बात की शुरुआत हिंदी में करूंगी और फिर अंग्रेजी में भी बीच-बीच में बोलूंगी। Today, शुरुआत I am speaking in English so that our ambassador could understand. Today, in the times of pandemic, you know, meeting like this, it's a blessing as as well as I am so sad. Because we have, we could have launched our book today. It is about Armenian genocide, and this is for the first time that a book, full-fledged book on Armenian genocide and related issues, uh, would have been, uh, you know, uh, launched, and that too in Hindi. Hindi, जो कि विश्व की बहुत सारे लोगों द्वारा बोली जाने वाली जुबान है, लेकिन हमारा दुर्भाग्य है कि हम सिर्फ बात कर रहे हैं और चूंकि people have you know just heard about the Armenian genocide and other things so I'll concentrate that what all we have covered in our book हमने अपनी किताब में क्या-क्या चीजें शामिल की हैं ये मैं आप लोगों को बता दूं तो कुछ उसका मतलब कोई ताप हो जाए जो मुझे इस समय हो रहा है दुख हो रहा है कि we are not able to launch our book हमारी किताब राजकमल प्रकाशन से छप रही छप रही है एंड आई एम वेरी ग्रेटफुल टू हिज एक्सीलेंसी दैट ही फॉर हिज सपोर्ट सो द पोएम्स वी हैव द पोएम्स दैट हैव बीन ट्रांसलेटेड विद द हेल्प ऑफ मिस माने मकत मकरत ज्ञान या चारेंस डेनियल वारुजान शिराज पारुवीर सेवा Tumanyan, Sia Mantho, Ruben Sevak, Anderson Fletna, he is not Armenian, Keith Garibian, he, he's very, he was born and brought up in India, and now he's in Canada. He is uh, uh, primarily an Armenian fellow. Keith Garibian, Najwan Darvesh from Palestine, and two poems for of Suman Keshri as well. The stories of, of Hamastek, and Mugesh Galushian, and we have uh, put some part of uh, 40 days of Musa Dag by Franz Victor Warfel. We have taken the uh, taken some parts of experts excerpt from key Caribbean um, memoirs also. Then there is a write up of of course blessings and what we call it Prakathan by. Uh, our, uh, His Excellency, and one detailed interview by of Mr. Karu Varthanian. He is director of museums in uh, Armenia. Then this book also has theoretical articles. Vahakan Dadrian, it is typology of genocide. Professor Alexander Leban Hinton, critical genocide studies. Dr. Paul A. Levin, from archives to classroom, and one very important article by a, a Turkish writer and uh, his, his, his historian, Dr. Said Chikunalu. The mechanism for terrorizing minorities, capital, tax, and work battalions in Turkey during Second World War. This is very important. I, uh, you know, a lot of learning from this. And when I see things happening in our country and other uh, elsewhere in the world, then I think that I have this work uh, has given me a lot of understanding of how things work. Uh, you know, and uh, sometimes I feel sad and sometimes I feel that at least I am I'm a little more empowered to know, to work towards, you know, uh, this... Uh, very sad uh, things that, that may happen anywhere in the world. Then we have some accounts of suffering from the archives, uh, some part of UN resolution on genocide and recognition of Armenian genocide by various nations. We have given the list, some photographs and maps also. This is a very long editorial by me as well as Mane Makaratya. And uh, these are the things that we, 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 we have, that, that the book is um, um, uh, that the book comprises of. 
since I'm a po poet, so I would love to uh, read a poem that I have written. It's about uh, Armenia. This is in Hindi. Sorry, it, it has been translated in Armenian, but it's, it hasn't been translated in English. So I'll read it in Hindi. हमने रचे प्रेम गीत संगीनों के सायों तले हमने रचे प्रेम गीत संगीनों के सायों तले वे प्रेम गीत रचने के दिन नहीं थे वे प्रेम गीत रचने के दिन नहीं थे खदेड़े जा रहे थे हम अपने घरों से गलियों से गांवों से कस्बों से झुंड के झुंड चले जा रहे थे हम एक नामालूम दिशा में कालखंड में इवन टाइम वॉज नॉट वी आर नॉट एबल टू वॉज द टाइम वी वी नॉट एबल टू सेंस इट वॉज डे इट वॉज नाइट एंड वी आर जस्ट मूविंग रास्तों में हमने अपने ही लोगों को देखा रास्ते में हमने अपने ही लोगों को देखा सियारों के मुंह में देखा सूरज को छिपते गिद्धों के पीछे देखी खून और मांस पिंडो की बरसात होते देखे खून के ताल नदियां देखी लाल लाल वे प्रेम गीत रचने के दिन नहीं थे वे प्रेम करने के दिन नहीं थे हम जानते थे हम जानते थे हमारी देह गंध उनमें चाह नहीं घृणा ही भरेगी क्रोध से तमकमाने लगेंगे उनके चेहरे अंग प्रत्यंग उनके हथियार हो जाएंगे हमारे लिए भूमि कब्रगाह हो जाएगी हमारे लिए हवा भारी होगी लोथरों की भू से तब हमने प्रेम की बचा हम जानते थे हमारी दुर्गंध उनमें चाह नहीं घृणा ही भरेगी क्रोध से तम तमान लगेंगे उनके चेहरे अंग प्रत्यंग हथियार हो जाएंगे हमारे लिए भूमि कब्रगाह हो जाएगी हमारे लिए हवा भारी होगी लूथरो लोथरो की बू से तब हमने प्रेम की रचे एन उन आंख उगलती आंखों के सामने हमने रचे प्रेम गीत एन उन आंख आग उगलती आंखों के सामने उसने मुझे फूल दिए कुछ जंगली उसने मुझे फूल दिए कुछ जंगली और मेरे होठों को इबादत सच हुआ और मेरे होठों को इबादत सच हुआ उसने मेरी देह में चाहत के बीज बोए एन संगीनों के साय में इस तरह अपनी उम्मीदों को हमने चकमक सा छिपाए रखा अपने हृदय में इस तरह अपनी उम्मीदों को हमने चकमक सा छिपाए रखा अपने हृदय में और इस तरह हमने प्रेम गीत रचा थैंक यू सो मच this was a poem this is a poem that that is been that is uh, you know in the book it's I'm, one more poem is there but i won't read that you read the book and i really thank uh, vivekanand international foundation for giving us an opportunity to come and together to mourn those who died uh, thank you suman ji for uh, participating and thank you for giving us uh, a kind of a preview of the uh, book uh, which you are co-editing with uh, several other uh, people and uh, also i think uh, you had a very powerful uh, message uh, in your poem which is quite eternal and uh, uh, universal uh, if you listen to the uh, message now i request uh, professor ashwini mahapatra to kindly make his remarks फीचर्स modern turkish republic very nuts and let me tell you the modern turkish republic in two sense of the term quote unquote artificial huntington called okay to rise to as a torn state i said is 100% artificial artificiality re reflected 
in the territorially delimited state of what is called modern Turkish Republic, artificially reflected in the construction of the national identity, which is nothing but the mono-ethnic identity of Turkey, artificially reflected in the idea of a state, where every state needs to be an idea, so-called secular democracy, is this kind of secularism which has been thrust on 90, more than 90% Muslim population. Sometimes I keep reminding my students, see, the present Turkish president, the Republic president, once said, either you are a Muslim or secular. The two things cannot go together. So it is a man, so you have more secularism on more than 90% of the Muslim population who are not familiar with the secular ethos at all. Then come to artificial democracy. The democracy in Turkey has turned into either civilian autocracy and prior, prior to the military autocracy. So it still remains a struggling illiberal democracy. It has long way to go to become a full fledged Indian variety democracy. So why I mentioned the artificial character of modern Turkish Republic? The reason being, this is very much reflected in Turkish foreign policy pursuit even today. You'll find the kind of the way Turkish government often, you know, uh, blows hot and uh, cold and hot. You see, vis its neighbor, whether it is Russia or Syria or Iraq or the United States of America. Look at the policy. It is confused, inconsistent. So underlying that inconsistent artificial character of the state and the confused state of affairs that prevails even today in the artificial modern Turkish Republic, the communist Republic today, if you look at this whole the, the phenomenon, what you call basically basic event of Armenian genocide, it's quite, to me, I won't call it you know, natural. In a way, it was a kind of, it is a kind of prerequisite. It's kind of prerequisite to the creation of a mono-ethnic state. Somebody mentioned about the Armenians' demand for certain rights. Not true. The similar demands were articulated by the Arabs before, from the last quarter of the 19th century. But the Arabs were accommodated. They were never annihilated, liquidated the way the Armenians were. It is much to do with the ethnic aspect of it. And as somebody, some scholar has rightly uh, uh, used a new terminology called gentrification. The gentrification refers to cleaning up the old in preparation for the new. What was the new? It's a creation of a complete mono-ethnic state which will be represented by the Kemalist Republic, where all other identities are forcefully assimilated or incorporated into the national identity of Turkey itself. So Armenian ethnic cleansing, or gentrification, or genocide, whatever terminology you prefer to, you prefer to use is fine, was the precursor to the creation of the Turkish Republic. So I see as a historical continuum. So when I look, at, uh, you look at the things happened in retrospect. It's a kind of historical continuum. It's true. There was a time you had an autocrat like Abdul Hamid II, and this the, the region was ruled by the uh, Young Turks. The Young Turks' dreams were very much shared by uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. That is the creation of a hundred percent Turkic state. So that's what you know. That's the way it happened. So if the the Turkish leader for last couple of decades have been trying hard to hide it, not to accept it. What is the compulsion? The compulsion being that the whole history of Turkey is artificially constructed, the whole narrative. How, how are they going to you know, place a position, Armenian genocide, in the historical narrative? That is the way the generation after generation have been taught about it. Oh, the great Ottoman Empire, multi-ethnic, tolerant, all that stuff we also keep hearing in India which was not true, which doesn't tally with the reality that existed in Ottoman Empire. So how we are going to place that, the genocide aspect of it? Maybe certain sections are a little wary of the compensation or the reparation which will actually be demanded by the Armenian side. And it could be a kind of slur of the black spot on the, on the Turks as a whole. At the time, they were struggling hard to, at one point in time, they are struggling hard to become part of Europe, European Union, but that they have already dispelled with that illusion ever since the European Union shut the door on the face that you are not eligible to become a full fledged member of European Union because you are not 100% European, even if you claim to be so. So, in this way, the whole uh, Armenian genocide issue, the theme, has to be seen in larger converse 
and it does have the continuing political historical relevance both for Turkey as well as the countries around Turkey. So what has in a way facilitated, let me put it this way, facilitated the survival of Turkish Republic, forget about its so-called prosperity, 2023, the great the millennial dream of Turks, you know, 100 years, they'll be completing the largest nation, the most prosperous country, and the great new Ottoman, the Erdogan. You know, it's, it, it is precisely because of its geographical location, nothing else. It did maximize the advantages that what is called the, 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 the uh, uh, it is called the strategic rent because of its location on the border of former Soviet Union during the entire Cold War period. In the post Cold War period, because of its location and you know, the location and the territorial contiguity or the proximity of the country like Iraq in 1991, subsequently 2000, so 2011 onwards with Syria, and subsequently obviously with Georgia. These are the things which, in a way, contributed to. The survival of modern Turkey's republic, we put it this way, otherwise, otherwise, is artificially created independent sovereign entity would not have survived without, without that kind of location, what Huntington once called tone country, that struggle is still on inside Turkey, outside Turkey, among the Turkish diaspora. What are we? Are you Muslim? Turks, Europeans, the dilemma persist even today. And this whole incident of Armenian genocide has to be seen reviewed in the broader context of the identity diagram of Turkey, both in political as well as in ethnic terms. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your views on how you look at uh, Turkey. Turkey has uh, uh, assumed a certain importance in the current uh, geopolitics also. But we can discuss it a uh, little bit uh, during the Q&A. And now we have, uh, I think, about uh, 20 minutes. Uh, so if there are anybody uh, anybody who would like to make any observation, comment, or uh, questions, but uh, please keep them uh, very brief so that we can cover as many as uh, we can. Please identify yourself. Uh, <coughs> Yes, Anil. <clears throat> so my question, I have two questions actually to two of the speakers. Uh, my first question was to Ambassador Armin uh, Matirosyan. So my question there is, I mean, he talked about this um, uh, initiative which um, Armenia has taken to establish diplomatic relations with Turkey. Now, given the background of the history, um, what has made Armenia uh, at this point in time to think uh, that this would be responded to favorably by Turkey, especially uh, by the current regime? And um, is it some? Is it an, is there an indication that Turkey would respond uh, favorably uh, to this this suggestion? That's my question to him. I have a question also to. Uh, Mr. Suren Vanikyan, and uh, that is about uh, you know the feeling today in Armenia uh, about the genocide uh, because you know many years have passed and uh, both in Turkey and in Armenia people have grown up uh, on a certain belief and um, not only a belief but also uh, on um, on the basis of certain facts that have been explained to them in school, college, uh, and otherwise. Uh, so, is there a strong enough uh, thinking in in uh, in Armenia today that this uh, issue uh, must be kept alive for the future, or this is dissipated over time? That's my question Thank to you. him. Thank you. Let's take a couple of more questions and then. Uh, our speakers can uh, answer them in one go. Anybody else? Or is it my, yeah, okay. Maybe then uh, you can think of through the questions. Let me uh, turn to the Ambassador. Ambassador, would you like to take on uh, Ambassador Vadava's question? About, about you know, uh 
conditions that Armenia in 2000 uh, came up with this initiative? I believe this was the question. Yes. What are yes. the conditions? Why? Why? What is the? Is it the right time for you to normalize? And yeah. What yeah. Turkey response was it? Yeah. So uh, look. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to just remind that, by the way, then I was working representing Armenia at the United Nations as a permanent representative and uh, had some, you know, uh, not direct participation, but, uh, you know, gathering information about the general mood, uh, talking to the Turkish uh, diplomats, mm -hmm. checking, checking the, you know, uh, the environment. Uh, so have uh, had some uh, sort of first-hand information. Let me remind you then that then the president of Turkey was Abdullah Gül. Erdogan then was a prime minister, and David Oğlu was his chief advisor. Uh, uh, so political team was quite different from nowadays, and I. Personally, I knew Abdullah Gül uh, from 19th when we both were, uh, I was a head of Armenian national delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe and Abdullah Gül then was a member of Turkish delegation to Parliamentary Assembly. So we knew a sort of each other, had different, uh, you know, talks and discussions uh, in Strasbourg. Uh, and apart from purely Turkish dimension of this process, attempt to rec reconcile or normalize our relations, there was a second, second component re uh, related to the Nagorno-Karabakh issue. So in 2008, uh, the new president uh, was elected and new president uh, coming to office, obviously he was resolute to address both problems of Nagorno-Karabakh and also uh, of Turkish uh, normalization of Turkish relations. And we thought then that since the, uh, it seemed to us that normalization as a task would be easier, we, it was decided to start with normalization of our relations with Turkey, which would, positively contribute to the resolution of the Nagorno-Karabakh problem through making environment or overall regional, regional environment more conducive. And there were, uh, you know, this term was coined of soccer diplomacy because president of Armenia, then president of Armenia visited Turkey for soccer game. Then Abdullah Gül came to Yerevan for again, soccer game between our two national teams. So there were direct meetings and there was a plus, apart from our personal talks and personal, you know, uh, comprehension of the environment, there was a very strong backing from the international community, from the leading states of international community. Uh, and first of all, I mean, Russian Federation, the president of Russian Federation, the United States, uh, president of France, the European Union, uh, Switzerland, so many, many countries, uh, leading countries dealing with the uh, affairs in the region and beyond, were directly involved as the mediators. So we had a strong signal that timing was very good. And that is why the pre then president, uh, President Sarkisian, he came up with this initiative. And by the way, I would say that initiative was not accepted, you know, uh, uh, positively, only posit in a positive way. So diaspora, uh, most and foremost, was against this initiative. Uh, Armenian society also was divided on this issue, but nevertheless, president came up with this initiative, hoping that normalization of our relations uh, with Turkey will change the environment in the region and would strongly, uh, we positively contribute to the Resil ongoing talks on Nagorno-Karabakh. And as I said, there were signals from different places, uh, mediators, uh, different countries, encouraging both uh, states. And the process had gone quite positively, uh, and it 
completed, it was uh, uh, inaugurated by the signing of protocols. But immediately after signing, you know, there was a first surprise that after signing the Turkish side, prime minister himself, not the president, and as later we witnessed, you know, they separated. It was a one team. Abdullah Gül was one of the founders of the party, but then they were separated. And uh, as a prime minister, uh, Erdogan came up with, you know, this idea that protocols should go for ratification to the parliament, although it, it was not in the package. And then came second surprise that we cannot sign, we cannot ratify the protocols unless Nagorno-Karabakh uh, problem is resolved which was, you know, crying for a moon because there were no preconditions for fast resolution of Nagorno-Karabakh problem. We did hope that the normalization of our relation with Turkey will contribute positively on the resolution of Nagorno-Karabakh. So there were very strong signals. And as I said, un including until and including the moment of ratification, we were very hopeful that the process will come to its logical conclusion. But, uh, you know, the Erdogan, with its uh, unpredictable policies, which we still view even today as a president already, uh, that is why I uh, mentioned in my, uh, you know, in my message that he, he torpedoed the whole process. So in a way, he put his, you know, ethnic, ethnic, uh, Con connections with Azerbaijan, ethnic affiliation with Azerbaijan ahead of the regional interests. Had Turkey behaved differently then in 2008, in 2009, during the process of, you know, of, this tor uh, of these talks, today in the region we would have had totally different situation. I strongly believe to what I'm telling you. But regrettably, we, uh, you know, we have uh, what we have today. And if just two minutes, I would like to, since, you know, Professor Mahapatra referred to the, you know, Turkish uh, policies, I would like to elaborate a little, a little bit more, a few words about, um, you know, modern Turkish policies, which are quite revisionist in rhetoric, but uh, traditionalist in actual actions. So rhetoric is attempted to be at least partially converted into real politics, uh, real politics, if there are suitable conditions in international arena. And, uh, you know, your uh, honorable minister of foreign affairs, external affairs, uh, Dr. Jai Shankar, uh, last year, he very, very nicely and to the point uh, depicted, you know, the whole situation that we have today in international affairs and which are quite, quite beneficial for politicians like, you know, Erdogan. So uh, Dr. Jan Shankar, Jan Shankar talked about dilution of alliance discipline and proliferation of the so-called frenemies, which promote uh, transactional ethos in international affairs. And combined with the fact that big powers are dealing today, we see as they are dealing more opportunistically which, with each other, their behavior encourages countries like Turkey to act likewise. So this is where the unpredictability of the, you know, Erdogan's policy originates from. International, uh, overall international environment of international affairs is very conducive for politicians like uh, Erdogan, and I believe that as the center of power, global center of power, moves further from the Euro-Atlantic region to Asia, we will also, you know, witness different, not only rhetoric, but also attempts of Erdogan to get involved into regional affairs in South Asia more actively and most probably more destructively. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I have taken... Uh, it has taken too long. Thank you, Mr. Gup. Um, okay, uh, uh, let me uh, try briefly <coughs> uh, reply the question. Why I'm saying briefly because you know this memory matters 
uh, this transformation of uh, historical memory uh, on Armenian genocide is the topic for another uh, speech, for another presentation, but I will try to do it uh, just, uh, I will try to uncover some layers of this very, very complicated, very complex, complex problem. The first uh, thing about uh, nowadays generation and their uh, attitude to, to, to uh, Armenian genocide memory, of course it's changing. For example, for me, Armenian genocide is personal story. It's family story because I met my grandmother who was, uh, uh, who was a survivor of Armenian genocide. She lost all his fam her family uh, besides of one brother and they grew up in uh, orphanage and the name of her brother was Suren. I was named after uh, the survivor of Armenian genocide. And it, this, uh, this metaphysical, let's say, uh, connection tied between that person who survived uh, Armenian genocide and me is very important for me because it's, as I said, is my is part of my family heritage, family uh, uh, legacy. Uh, nowadays, generation, uh, my children, for example, they never met survivor of Armenian genocide. They never met person who, in some way, was uh, connected to this topic. And for them, it's something something different, different, and. Uh, but at the same time, for them, it's also very important. Why? Because uh, they, uh, in school, they, they uh, uh, read a lot about Ararat Mountain, for example, about uh, Armenian homeland uh, left in, in, in Turkey, nowadays Turkey, because all our literature, our rich our literature, were based on this concept of homeland, on this concept of uh, living in your own home, home in your own soul and create uh, goods in in your homeland and that's why it's uh, you cannot avoid even if just think uh, imagine that one day Armenian gov government uh, would decide stop to stop to 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 remember Armenian genocide hypothetically it it, it would not be uh, possible because all our literature all our uh, art is uh, so uh, is uh, soaked by the the memory of of lost homeland uh coming to lost uh, homeland you know consequences of armenian genocide it's uh, it's not just it was not just killing of many people it was not just uh, uh, attempt to destroy population armenians and populations at this community but it was attempt to to uh, decline of armenian civilization because Armenians lived there thousands of years, they create their own way of living, they created their culture, they created their civilization there. And uh, this attempt to decline Armenian civilization um, was, uh, uh, was crime of some magnitude but that I think uh, four generations are not enough to, to, uh, uh, to forget. To forget. Uh, and we cannot, if, even if we want, we cannot, because each day we see Ararat from, uh, for, from Yerevan. Ararat is very close to Armenia. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's a sacral place for, for in, in, in Armenian memory and Armenian identity. And uh, each day in Yerevan, you can see this mountain Ararat, uh, that, uh, that mountains in, in the city. And it's so close to Armenia, but it's, 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 uh, uh, unreachable. It's it's uh, it's very. You cannot go there because of closed borders. Because Turkey closed uh, borders with uh, Armenia. And if you want to go and touch Ararat, it's only 20, 30 kilometers from the borders of Armenia. You you, you the only way to do it is to do it through from other countries, but not directly uh, go there. Um, and uh, you know. Uh, of course, the uh, Armenian educational system, and uh, we all try to uh, um, not to leave this burden on the shoulders of, of, of our generations. That's why we try to uh, to 
uh, to transfer this memory in specific ways. And you know, last uh, in last years, uh, there is a notion about the um, uh, the victory of Armenian people. Um, you know, when uh, memorial complex in Cicernakabert in uh, uh, one of the hills of Yerevan was constructed in 1965. It's next, 19, the decision was made in 1965 it, and it was constructed and uh, opened in 1967. Uh, the, it was named Revival of Armenia. Paradoxically, but uh, this place is not associated only with grief and sadness. Of course, it's symbol of the greatest tragedy of Armenian history. But at the same time, uh, this uh, this memorial symbolizes that uh, um, Turkish uh, government couldn't uh, achieve their goals, and Armenian revived, Armenian uh, uh, rebirth, and Armenians, and uh, they even created their own independent state. And, and now we are, we uh, we uh, live in in independent uh, Armenia and. Uh, uh, so this message that we survived, we are winners, we are strong, and we were strong enough to overcome this uh, this crime, this uh, uh, immense crimes. Uh, crime is is very widespread in in, in our day Armenia. But but of course we should remember. We should remember. We should uh, uh, we should. Uh, we should try to to uh, to transfer this memory uh, to avoid the oblivion of the innocent victims of Armenian genocide. And at the same time, it's not for only for us. It's for the humanity. It's for them. Uh, for for uh, uh, not only for Armenians, but for all nations all around the world. Because uh, as we stress. Armenian genocide well, is not just Armenian history. It's history of uh, human being and uh, stressing on Armenian genocide, remembering Armenian genocide and struggling against denial and for recognition of Armenian genocide. We are on the first rows of the struggle against genocide itself as a phenomenon, as an attempt of groups to solve their political problems with the extermination. Dr. Gupta. Yeah. Yes. So, yes, yes, sorry. So, I uh, just want to thank uh, the ambassador, uh, Surin Manukyan, uh, Suman Kasheri, Mr. Mahapatra, Professor Mahapatra, and other participants for uh, being with us uh, today. I think this has been a, a very uh, somber uh, uh, event. And uh, but the discussion was uh, very rich, and I think it has raised uh, some uh, very important issues. Uh, as I, I agree that we must uh, continue to remember these uh, uh, um, events so that uh, we are forewarned about what may happen in future. But at the same time, it is also necessary to uh, make uh, a progress towards the future. And uh, today we are seeing that the world is being uh, reconstructed in many ways. And uh, we are looking for uh, new organizing principles. Uh, Ambassador mentioned uh, compassion, but compassion is something that is completely missing from uh, international relations. If you look at uh, our uh, uh, Vivekananda, he has uh, been talking, he has talked about uh, harmony and diversity. Now, in today's world, diversity is going to be a given. Nobody can run away from uh, uh, diversity. Even in uh, ethnically pure states, some kind of a diversity would always arise. So the question of uh, how to have harmony amongst diversity, that I think is a big challenge. Uh, compassion you mentioned, uh, our Prime Minister mentions about uh, uh, world is a family. I think these are not just rhetorics, but we should try and uh, uh, convert them into practical principles. So I think that's why these uh, uh, discussions are very important. We have also seen in some parts of the world, for instance, uh, in uh, South Africa, 
where there was apartheid and there was a, a problem between the uh, black and the white community and uh, there was apartheid for many years. And there was uh, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was set up and they tried to move forward. So the many, uh, many attempts have been made uh, so that uh, to uh, bring some kind of a uh, resolution to these problems. So I think discussion uh, is very important and denial is not the answer. I think uh, the first and foremost is that there should not be any denial. And perhaps it is in that uh, context that in 2008, perhaps that uh, uh, effort was made uh, of a reconciliation, normalization between uh, Turkey and uh, uh, Armenia. And if it had gone forward, perhaps things would have been uh, very different. Uh, I agree with the Ambassador uh, Martirosyan. Um, and it could have perhaps helped in resolving the nagorno karabakh issue also, which is still uh, outstanding. It's a very serious issue. And probably that's one reason why uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan being together on that, and the whole Muslim world, in fact. So it's also a problem for um, Armenia. But anyway, that's a discussion for some uh, other time. So thank you very much, uh, everyone. And I hope that uh, uh, you stay safe and uh, uh, we come out of this uh, very extraordinary circumstances and we can meet uh, in person at some time. And perhaps uh, at that point of time, carry forward this discussion uh, when we release uh, that book, uh, whenever that happens. So thank you very much, Ambassador. And uh, thank you, uh, Anutma, for organizing this uh, show. And thank you, everyone, for joining. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.